I'm back in 1 Timothy. Look at 1 Timothy chapter 1. 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 7. It says, Desiring to be teachers of the law, understanding neither what they say nor whereof they affirm. So you got these people going around desiring to be teachers of the law, teaching you got to keep the law to be saved, teaching you got to keep the law to stay saved. They don't understand Paul's epistles. Just like Peter said in 2 Peter 3, 15 through 16, they're hard to be understood. They do not understand the doctrine from the Pauline epistles. That's the biggest problem with people today. And you know this, if you just talk to them at work or wherever, they'll go everywhere else except to Paul to prove salvation in today's age. And they'll go to Matthew, they'll go to the Old Testament, they'll go everywhere except for the Pauline epistles. And they are desiring to be teachers of the law, understanding neither what they say nor whereof they affirm. Now look at this. But we know that the law is good if a man use it lawfully. How do you use it lawfully? Well, you use it to show somebody that they need to be saved, to show somebody that they are a sinner. But it can't save them. That's how you use it lawfully. Show somebody they're a sinner with it, but you lead them to salvation through the gospel. It says, knowing this, that the law is not made for a righteous man. You know, if you're doing what you're supposed to do, uh, you don't have to worry about it. You're saved. You're doing what you're supposed to do. You don't have to worry about it. It's made for the lawless and disobedient, for the ungodly and for sinners, for unholy and profane, for murderers of fathers and murderers of mothers for manslayers. So for murderers of fathers, you hear about that a lot today. Murderers of mothers, you hear about that a lot today. Uh, we're living in uh, the last days of the church age. One of the marks of that is children are disobedient to parents to the point that they're pulling the trigger on their parents. For murderers of fathers, for murderers of mothers, for manslayers. You just saw that again. Uh, somebody went into a school shooting up a bunch of kids in a school in Nashville, Tennessee. You just saw that again. And it's went from being <clears throat> uh, serial killers heavily in the 70s and 80s. Now they got so much... Um, forensic stuff, DNA stuff going on. You can't do that anymore. So now they're just killing everybody at once, getting a gun, shooting up a place at once. Man's going to find a way to kill. And they can't get away with, really get away with being the uh, serial killer type stuff no more. Now they're just mass shooters. You know, you keep people that just Keep denying God, denying the, the scriptures, doing what they want to do, living in vile sin. They're going to end up doing things that they never thought they would do. They're going to end up being manslayers. And then it says, for whoremongers. The law is not made for a righteous man, but for whoremongers. And, you know, the Bible talks about in Hebrews, marriage is honorable in all, and the, and the bed undefiled, but whoremongers and adulterers, God will judge, in Hebrews 13, 4. Marriage is honorable in all, and the bed undefiled. Why not just find one woman, marry her, and stay married to her? No, people don't want to do that anymore. They want to be whores and whoremongers. They want to be living in fornication. That's who the law is made for. The law is not made for a righteous man, but it's made for whoremongers. You can take the law and show a whoremonger that he's a whoremonger, <coughs> convict him, show him that he needs to be saved. So the law is not made for a righteous man, but for whoremongers. Uh, and they call that today, if you're not familiar with that term, they call that a man whore or a whore hopper or a player or many times a pimp. 
And you got people going around uh, calling each other a pimp like that's a good thing. No, that's a bad thing. Uh, a pimp is a horrible person. He's selling other people uh, sexually for money. He is a horrible person. But people use, uh, the devil loves to take things that are evil and make them good. He loves for people to think that that's a good term. He, the Bible talks about woe unto them that call evil good and good evil, that put darkness for light and light for darkness, that put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. That's what the devil does. He wants to make you think that that's cool. No, it's a sin. It says, For whoremongers, for them that defile themselves with mankind. Well, that would be the sodomy stuff. Let me show you some stuff about the sodomy stuff. Because for some reason, people do not know that homosexuality is a sin. Look at Leviticus 18.22. I mean, it's a really well-known verse. You probably know it off the top of your head. But let's just look at it. <clears throat> Leviticus 18.22 For them that defile themselves with mankind. It says in Leviticus 18. Let's look at verse 20. Moreover, thou shalt not lie carnally with thy neighbor's wife to defile thyself with her. That's talking about an adulterer right there. You don't want to lie with your neighbor's wife. That's his wife. You got a wife lie with her why do you want to lie with everybody else's wife except your own so right there we see adultery is a sin and thou shalt not let any of thy seed pass through the fire to Molech neither shalt thou profane the name of thy God I am the Lord that's talking about child sacrifice they were letting their son and daughter pass through the fire to Molech and burning them in a, in a child sacrifice obviously Burning your son and daughter in the fire, that's a sin. Now look at this. Thou shalt not lie with mankind as with womankind. It is an abomination. That's saying a man shouldn't lie with a man like he's supposed to do with a woman. That is an abomination. And you got all these people going around uh, claiming to be Bible believers. To top it off, they're claiming to be Bible believers they have no idea what they're talking about because they're saying homosexuality is not a sin. How is it not a sin when it says, Thou shalt not lie with mankind as with womankind? It's an abomination. And you can point them and say, Well, is adultery wrong? They'll say, Yeah. Well, okay, we just read about adultery there in verse 20. You can point them and, and say, Well, um, what about bestiality? Is bestiality wrong? They'll say, Yeah. Well, look at the verse under Leviticus 18.22 that we just read, and it says, Neither shalt thou lie with any beast to defile thyself therewith, neither shall any woman, neither shall any woman, neither shall any woman stand before a beast to lie down there to. It is confusion. You see that? It's mentioned in the same... In the same verses as uh, going against adultery, and the same verses as going against child sacrifice, and the same verses as bestiality. So you can see clearly that homosexuality is wrong. It's mentioned with all these other vile things. And you're going to have people that don't agree with Leviticus 18.22. They're going to say, well, that's Old Testament. Okay, I'll show you what else you can do. You can take them... To the book of Romans. So go turn to the book of Romans. And we're going to look at Romans 126. For people that say, well, this is just Old Testament, because you're going to have people that say, well, he was against it in the Old Testament, but in the New Testament, we got more liberty to be this way. And it's not true. Romans 126. It says, For this cause God gave them up into vile affections. Notice that phrase, vile affections. Homosexuality, 
It's a vile affection. For even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. The natural use is man with a woman, woman with a man. Any other thing you do is not natural and it's against nature. That's why the average lost man, the average lost man is repulsed by homosexuality. And they make you think that everybody's for homosexuality. And I admit more people are going for that because they're being brainwashed. But the average lost person, even, is against it. They just make you think that everybody's for it when they're not. I mean, you see, you see all these people, all these uh, uh, sodomites kissing on TV, all the pride parades, all that stuff. They're just trying to brainwash you, make you think that that's more popular than it actually is. Now, it's true that it's getting worse and worse, but still the average guy, he's repulsed by two men kissing because it's nasty. And um, it says it's against nature. And then look at verse 27, Romans 1, 27. And likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman. Look at that, leaving the natural use of the woman. It's unnatural. Look at this, burned in their lust one toward another. Men with men working that which is unseemly. It calls it unseemly. And receiving in themselves that recompense of their error which was meat. They're going to get what's coming to them. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. They're doing those things which are not convenient. It's not Man with man is not convenient. They don't have the right parts for it to be convenient. You know, uh, something that ought to prove to you that there is a God is... A man and a woman can get together and birth another person. A man and a man can't do that. A man and a woman have all the right parts to get together and make another person. That's a miracle. All the stuff that goes into just the baby being in, in, the, in the mom and everything else. That proves that God is real. And that proves that homosexuality is wrong and that's not the way God intended it he made it for it to be a man with a woman he made Adam and Eve back there in Genesis chapter 2 and <clears throat> he wanted the man to leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife it didn't say nothing about a man on man stuff and we'll go to another place 1 Corinthians 6 9 1 Corinthians 6, 9. It says, Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate. This stuff with men acting like women, dressing up like women, is nasty. That's wrong. It's a sin. A man should act like a man. And a woman should act like a woman. You shouldn't be do any. You shouldn't be doing anything to blur the lines to where somebody does not know what you are. Anything. A man should be a man. A woman should be a woman. You need to be content with the fact that God made you what you are. And if you're having feelings like you wish you were a woman, you should just fight that with everything in you. If you're a woman that thinks you should be a man, you need to fight that with everything in you. Do not be effeminate. And then it says, nor abusers of themselves with mankind. That would be the sodomite. Man should not lie with mankind as with womankind. It says in Leviticus 18.22, Romans chapter 1, 26 through 27, showed you it's unnatural, it's against nature. Verse 28 showed you it wasn't convenient. That right there, 1 Corinthians 6, 9, it shows you that 
It's unrighteous to be effeminate. It's unrighteous to abuse yourselves with mankind. Now back to 1 Timothy 1 and verse 8, it says, But we know that the law is good if a man use it lawfully, knowing this and that the law is not made for a righteous man, but it's made for the whoremongers. It's made for them that defile themselves with mankind. I mean, we can show you by the law that what you're doing is wrong with the sodomite stuff. For them that defile themselves with mankind, for men stealers. You're seeing that a lot today. That's, think about this, the sex trafficking stuff. You got people going around stealing people's kids right in front of them in broad daylight in the store. You can't even walk in a store in broad daylight. You got some crazy wretched person that's going to come and and steal your kid that you got to worry about you got to be looking at everybody you know <clears throat> you can't trust nobody even women are involved in it to because they seem more trustworthy even women coming into a store with a child there's been women coming to a store with a child and they steal somebody else's child and because it makes them look more trustworthy you see, a woman and a child, you wouldn't think, well, these people, they're going to steal my child. But they do. That happens. Men stealers. And you got a lot of that. People going around stealing somebody else's child. That's who the law is made for. For liars. Now, that gets us all right there. Let God be true, but every man a liar, as Paul said. You've probably told a lie this week. You can tell a lie with a facial expression. You can tell a lie by shrugging your shoulders. Uh, you can tell a lie by being quiet. You know, we're naturally liars. For perjured persons. For perjured persons. Lying under oath. People that lie under oath. Your law is made for you. And if there be any other thing that is contrary to sound doctrine, if it's the opposite of sound doctrine, there's a problem. And that's what Paul's about, sound doctrine. And here, the sound doctrine is in regards to your conduct. Let's look at some verses to go along with that. 1 Timothy 6.3 Sound doctrine in regards to your conduct. In 1 Timothy 6, 3, If any man teach otherwise and consent not to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and to the doctrine which is according to godliness. You know, teaching somebody how to live <coughs> godly is teaching them doctrine. That's sound doctrine. 1 Timothy 6, 3. And then look at Titus chapter 2, verses 1 through 7. Titus 2, 1 through 7. And Titus is another one of those pastoral epistles. He says in chapter 2, verse 1 in the book of Titus, but speak thou the things which become sound doctrine. Paul's all about doctrine. And then look what he says after that. He goes into conduct. That the aged men be sober, grave, temperate, sound in faith, in charity, and patience. That the aged women likewise, that they be in behavior as becometh holiness. Not false accusers, not given to much wine, teachers of good things, that they may teach the young men to be sober, to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, chaste, keepers at home, good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God be not blasphemed. Young men likewise exhort to be sober-minded in all things, showing thyself a pattern of good works and doctrine, showing uncorruptness, gravity, sincerity, sound speech that cannot be condemned, that he that is of the contrary part may be ashamed, having no evil thing to say of you. So you got doctrine connected with good conduct. And so doctrine goes beyond just teaching the rapture. 
It's also about teaching somebody good conduct. And the law is not made for a righteous man, but it's made for anything that is contrary to sound doctrine as well. As these other things like whoremongers, them that defile themselves with mankind from men stealers, anything that is contrary to sound doctrine. That's who the law is made for. It says, according to the glorious gospel of the blessed God, which was committed to my trust in 1 Timothy 1.11. So it was committed to Paul's trust. Paul was shown some things. That's why he calls it his gospel. Because he was shown some things for the body of Christ that hadn't been revealed to anyone else yet. Paul was shown some things that nobody else not had seen yet. Not Peter, not John, not James. Look at Galatians chapter 1 and verse 12. And we'll talk about this for a minute. Galatians 1, 12. In Galatians 1.12, it says, For I neither received it of man. We'll start in verse 11. But I certify you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached of me is not after man. For I neither received it of man, neither was I taught it, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. Paul did not get his gospel from another man. He got it from the Lord Jesus Christ himself. That's why he calls it his gospel. Now look at Ephesians chapter 3. In Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 3. These are Paul's epistles we're looking at. Ephesians 3, 3. Start, let's start in verse 2. If you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God which is given me to you word. So a dispensation is God giving something to somebody. How that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery, as I wrote afore in few words, whereby when you read you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men, as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit, so this was revealed to Paul, and it was not known in other ages. Then look what it says, what was not known in other ages. Look at verse 6. That the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel, whereof I was made a minister according to the gift of the grace of God given unto me by the effectual working of his power. Unto me, who am less than the least of all saints, is this grace given, that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ, and to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery which from the beginning of the world hath been hidden Christ, who created all things by Jesus Christ. So Paul was shown some things by the Lord Jesus. He was shown <clears throat> that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body. He was sh shown the gospel that would get people into the body of Christ, Gentiles and Jews in the body of Christ. He was shown that gospel that would get people saved. And he was shown the mystery of the body of Christ, that everybody who will believe on the Lord Jesus Christ is put into the body of Christ. He was shown that. It was revealed to him. It wasn't that Paul was the first one who was saved. It wasn't that Paul that was the first one who was in the body of Christ. He talks about in Romans 16 that there was people in Christ before he was. But he was shown that people would be put into the body of Christ. Before him, they were put in the body of Christ and didn't know it. So that's the mystery of the body of Christ. And it was shown to Paul first. And that's why he calls it his gospel. In places like Romans 2.16, Romans 16.25, 2 Timothy 2.8. He calls it his gospel. And it's committed to 
his trust. So, he says, according in 1 Timothy 1.11, according to the glorious gospel of the blessed God, which was committed to my trust, and I thank Christ Jesus our Lord, who hath enabled me, for that he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry. So Paul was called, just like he says at the beginning of his epistles, he's called, called to be an apostle. And he began preaching as soon as he was called. But he wasn't enabled until he spent some time in Arabia. And God revealed some things to him. And this enables him to minister. At the same time, Paul's faith, faithfulness was taken into consideration by the Lord. So he was called. Then he was enabled. And then also counted faithful. Let me show you. Let me show you when he was called. Look back at Acts 9.20. Yeah, Acts 9.20. In Acts 9.20... And straightway he preached Christ in the synagogues that he is the Son of God. Notice it says straightway. As, as soon as he was called, he started preaching. This is when he... Uh, Acts chapter 9 is when you see Paul get saved on the road to Damascus. I'm going to show you where uh, Paul gets saved here. In Acts chapter 9, verse 1, it says, And Saul yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord. You see that Paul used to be named Saul and he's going around killing people, killing Christians, persecuting Christians. And it says he went into the high priest and desired of him letters to Damascus, to the synagogues, that if he found any of this way, <clears throat> whether they were men or women, he might bring them bound into Jerusalem. Now, here's where he's going to meet Jesus Christ. And as he journeyed, he came near Damascus. And suddenly there shone round about him a light from heaven. And he fell to the earth and heard a voice saying unto him, <clears throat> Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? The Lord Jesus said to Paul, Why are you persecuting me? And uh, Saul hadn't done anything directly to Jesus Christ. <clears throat> but he had been doing things to people who were in the body of Christ. And that's another proof that there were people in Christ before Paul. Paul was persecuting Jesus Christ because he was persecuting people that were in the body of Christ. <clears throat> and now look what Paul says. And he said, Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord... What will thou have me to do? That was the moment that Paul believed that the Lord is who he said he was. And he said, Lord, what would thou have me to do? And the Lord said unto him, Arise and go into the city, and it shall be told thee what thou must do. And the men which journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice, but seeing no man. And Saul arose from the earth, and when his eyes were opened, he saw no man. But they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. And he was three days without sight, and neither did he eat or drink, nor drink. And there was a certain disciple at Damascus named Ananias. And to him said the Lord in a vision, Ananias. And he said, Behold, I am here, Lord. And the Lord said to him, Arise and go into the street, which is called Straight, and inquire in the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus. For behold, he prayeth and hath seen in a vision a man... A man named Ananias coming in and putting his hand on him that he might receive his sight. Then Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard by many of this man how much evil he hath done to the saints at Jerusalem. See, the Christians knew all about Paul. They've heard of Paul. They knew he was 
a bad dude. And they were afraid of him because he was going around killing, persecuting Christians. And it says, And here he hath authority from the chief priest to bind all that call on thy name. But the Lord said unto him, Go thy way, for he is a chosen vessel unto me. See that? Paul is a chosen vessel to bear my name before the Gentiles. See that? The apostle Paul is the minister to the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. For I will show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. And the apostle Paul suffered all the way through his ministry up until the time he died. You know, thrice beaten with rods, suffered shipwreck, stoned. He said, a night and day I've been in the deep. He had the messenger of Satan buffeting him. And Ananias went his way and entered into the house, putting his hands on him and said, Brother Saul, the Lord, even Jesus, that appeared unto thee in the way as thou camest, hath sent me that thou mightest receive thy sight and be filled with the Holy Ghost. And immediately there fell from his eyes as it had been scales, and he received his sight forthwith and arose and was baptized. That's one of the reasons I do believe in baptism after salvation. Paul said, Be ye followers of me, even as I follow Christ. Lord Jesus was baptized. Paul was baptized. Everybody who's somebody in the New Testament that you read about was baptized. So why wouldn't I go ahead and be baptized well and follow their pattern? And when he had received meat, he was strengthened. Then was Saul certain days with the disciples which were at Damascus. And straightway he preached Christ in the synagogues that he is the Son of God. So right out of the gate, straightway, he preached Christ. As soon as he was called, he started preaching. But that's not when he got enabled. So this is the difference between being called and enabled. He's not enabled until he spent some time in Arabia and God revealed some things to him. This is when he would have revealed to him all these great mysteries that he reveals to us. Let me show you when he has revealed this stuff. In Galatians chapter 1 and verse 11. Yeah, back to Galatians chapter 1, verse 11. He says, But I certify you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached of me is not after man, for I neither received it of man, neither was I taught it, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. For you have heard of my conversation in times in time past in the Jews' religion, how that beyond measure I persecuted the church of God and wasted it, like we just read about. Paul persecuted the church. If if the church didn't start with Paul, how did he persecute the church of God? And you say, well, that's not talking about the church as the church, which is his body. But it obviously is because Paul's saying this in the church age. Paul's saying this in a church age epistle, and he calls those people he persecuted, the church of God. He persecuted the church of God and wasted it and profited in the Jews' religion above many my equals in my own nation, being more exceedingly zealous of the traditions of my fathers. He was so zealous about killing Christians, persecuting Christians. But when it pleased God who separated me from my mother's womb and called me by his grace to reveal his son in me that I might preach him among the heathen, Immediately, I conferred not with flesh and blood. You see, he didn't get the stuff he teaches from just flesh and blood. He said, Neither went I up to Jerusalem to them which were apostles before me. You see, he didn't get this from the other apostles. But I went into Arabia and returned again unto Damascus. Then, after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to see Peter and abode with him 15 days. But of the other of the apostles saw I none, save James, the Lord's brother. So he went up to Arabia for three years. And that's where he was revealed all this stuff. Paul got his revelation from God, not flesh and blood. Just like Moses got doctrine for the, the kingdom of heaven on Mount Sinai in Arabia, Paul also received doctrines for the kingdom of God in Arabia. And that's when he was enabled. He straightway, he started preaching the gospel as soon as he was called. Then, about three years, he gets by himself in Arabia and gets enabled. You see, God calls you, then you got to spend some time with him, 
and he enables you. And look at 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 12. And I thank Christ Jesus our Lord, who hath enabled me, for that he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry. Paul was counted faithful. He was tried and tested and counted faithful. Even though, look at the next verse, who was before a blasphemer and a persecutor, before he blasphemed the name of Jesus, before he persecuted the body of Christ, who was before a blasphemer and a persecutor and injurious. So he was a blasphemer. In Acts 26, 11, he compelled people to blaspheme. Not only did he blaspheme, but he would make other he would make Christians blaspheme. That's why you got all these people going around saying, Well, if you blaspheme the if you blaspheme the Lord, you can't be saved. That's not true because the Apostle Paul was getting Christians themselves to blaspheme. He was a blasphemer and a persecutor. Galatians 1.13 said he persecuted the church of God and wasted it. In Acts chapter 9, as you just saw, the Lord himself said, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? Paul was a blasphemer, a persecutor. He was injurious. That means he was violent. He caused harm. <clears throat> Look in Acts chapter 8 and verse 3. Go to back, back to Acts chapter 8 and verse 3. It says, as for Saul, he made havoc of the church, entering into every house and hailing men and women, committed them to prison. He made havoc of the church. He was before a blasphemer, a persecutor, an injurious. But look what it says, but I obtained mercy. If, if Paul can obtain mercy, then you can obtain mercy. If somebody like Paul can get saved and start preaching the gospel, then you could get saved and start preaching the gospel. You talk to a lot of people that the devil has made them feel like they can't be saved and that God can never use them. Paul got saved and he used him. Wicked King Manasseh, Manasseh back there got saved. He didn't get saved in the sense that Paul did, but he got right with the Lord and the Lord had mercy on him. God will have mercy on you. Who was before a blasphemer and a persecutor and injurious, but I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. You know, when Paul was doing this, he thought he was doing, when he was doing all that stuff, he thought he was doing the work of the Lord. He thought he was doing God's service. There's a lot of people involved in this false religion stuff and these cults and stuff they actually think they're doing God's service. And when they get the gospel revealed to them, and if they believe it, they become some of the greatest Christians there are. They're exceedingly zealous in their other religion. And mostly, when they get saved, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, that carries over into their Christian life, that zealousness. And that's what happened with Paul. And he says... Who was a before blasphemy and a persecutor and injurious, but I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly and unbelief. So he did it ignorantly. And that's the way lost people are. They're doing stuff ignorantly. Just like when you go to work and lost people come in there telling dirty jokes and cussing and even saying bad things about preachers and the church. They're doing it ignorantly and unbelief. They've been deceived. And that's why you have patience with lost people. Most of what they do is out of ignorance. And see, Paul was zealous and sincere as a lost man. He talks about in uh, Philippians 3, 4 through 6, how zealous he was. And those types of people are usually great Christians after their conversion. So be patient with them. And the grace of our Lord was exceeding abundant with faith and love, which is in Christ Jesus. 
Grace, that's God giving you something you don't deserve. And the grace is exceeding abundant. That means it's more than enough. And he talks about love, which is in Christ Jesus. And that reminds me of Romans 8, 38 through 39, where Paul said, For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. It ain't just love of God for lost people in general. It ain't just the love of that God has for the world. It's the love which is in Christ Jesus that you can't be separated from. And it's exceeding abundant. The faith and the love which is in Christ Jesus is exceeding abundant. It's more than enough. And he said, this is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation. That means you need to fully accept it. It's worthy to be fully accepted. You see, the big problem when you're talking to people about the Bible and about God, they believe there's a God. They believe some of the Bible, but they don't fully accept anything. They're very skeptical of it. And you'll notice that. You know, they believe God created everything, but then they believe he used evolution. They didn't fully accept the creation account. You see, they believe that God can save, but they believe they got to do it a little bit too. They don't fully accept God's way of salvation. But this is a faithful saying. And worthy of all acceptation. It's worthy of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners. You know, we we were just born into the world. But the Lord came into the world by his own choice. You, you were born into the world. But Christ Jesus came into the world. He chose to just to save you, to save sinners. And Paul said, of whom I am chief. Paul says he's the chief of sinners. Now I'm going to show you some other verses to go along with this. Look at 1 Corinthians 15.9. Look back at 1 Corinthians 15.9. Paul said there in 1 Timothy 1 that he's the chief of sinners. Look at what, it, what he says in 1 Corinthians 15, 9. He says, For I am the least of the apostles, that I am not meet to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. He said he's the least of the apostles. And now he, he's not even, it doesn't even, it's, he's not even meet to be called an apostle because he persecuted the church of God. Look at, you see Paul's view of himself? He's not saying he's sinless. He's not saying he's perfect. But he's a lot better than me and you are. Look at Ephesians 3.8. If the apostle Paul says he's least of the apostles and that he is the chief of sinners, that ought to show you that you ain't so hot either. Now look at what he says in Ephesians. First he said, I am least of the apostles. Now in Ephesians 3.8 he says, Unto me who am less than the least of all saints. First he said he was least of the apostles. Now he's saying he's less than the least of all saints. Unto me who am less than the least of all saints is this grace given, that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. So you see that? You see that growth in grace there? The more closer you get to God, the more vile you realize you actually are. He's, he said, I'm less than the apostles. I'm less than the least of all saints. And then you get to 1 Timothy, and he says, I'm the chief of sinners. Now, look what he says in Romans 7.24. Back in Romans 7.24, it really lays it out. He really lays it Romans 7 is so good to show somebody that even after you get saved, your flesh 
is still wicked, vile, capable of anything that you could have done before you were saved. Look at Romans 7 and verse 18. He says, For I know that in me, that is, in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. For the will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good I find not. For the good that I would I do not, but the evil which I would not, that I do. Now if I do that I would not, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. See that? When you get saved, you got two natures. The real you, the new you, you're saved, is saved, but you still got sin in your flesh. And there, you're, that's, your old man is, is sinful. Your new man is as righteous as Jesus Christ. And they're constantly fighting with each other. When you yield to the flesh, you give in to the, new man, the old man. When you yield to the Spirit, you're given into the new man. He, he says in verse 21 of Romans 7, I find then a law that when I would do good, evil is present with me. Look at this. For I delight in the law of God after the inward man. It's not the outward man, the flesh, that delights in the law of God. The flesh does not like the law of God. He says, but I see another law in my members, Warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. Now look what he says. Here's Paul, the apostle Paul himself, one of the greatest Christians that ever lived. Here is his opinion of himself. O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? He called himself a wretch. You are a wretch. I'm a wretch. Our flesh is bad, it's not good, it's evil, and it's capable of doing anything if we don't keep it in check and yield to the Spirit. Don't ever forget your flesh is evil and wicked and vile. Christians forget that, they start thinking they're so holy. No, you're capable of anything, and you're committing all types of sin, probably you don't even realize it. He says, I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord, so then with the mind I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. You got two natures. You got the spiritual man, the fleshy man. They're constantly at war with each other. So 1 Timothy 1.15, For this is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. And we'll stop there for now.